Coming up in our Mega Press Special Edition report, Mega Press takes a look at the nation's response to the Judge Zimmerman not guilty verdict for the shooting death of 17-year-old Trayvon Martin. All this and more next on Mega Press News 37. have just tuned in to the Team Tacker coverage with Megapress News 37 HD with Gwen Spinks, publisher and executive producer, Janita Hughes, news anchor, and Elizabeth Jackson, Treasure Coast, Florida news reporter. Megapress News 37 is a global news network bringing you 24 hours of top stories, weather reports, public service announcements, ads and commercials, news and views, letters to the editors, and more. Megapress News 37 also features the latest news and gospel entertainment, spotlighting global leaders making a difference, special events, and news talk show. And now for our Mega Press News 37 Special Edition Report. Please be seated. Uh, members of the jury, have you reached a verdict? If you'll please fold the verdict form and hand it to Dep Deputy Jarvis. In the Circuit Court of the 18th Judicial Circuit in and for Seminole County, Florida, State of Florida versus George Zimmerman. Verdict, we the jury find George Zimmerman not guilty. So say we all four person. I think it's outrageous. George Zimmerman is a cold-blooded murderer. He racially profiled Trayvon. He stopped him and he murdered him. Welcome to a special edition of the Price Factor, Mega Press News 37 with Elizabeth Jackson. I'm your host. On today, we have a group of young people and adults. We're in Hinesville, Georgia on location. We're here with Dr. Apostle Wilhelmina Brown, the senior pastor of Faithful Temple Church of Deliverance, and it's exciting. In the news recently, we the topic has been Trayvon Martin was justice served. So we have come to Hinesville, Georgia, which is a military town, and with Dr. Brown's young people, we're going to have a public forum discussing the topics. What better way than to hear what young people, how they have been affected and what their thoughts are concerning this tragedy. Dr. Brown, welcome and thank you so very much for opening up your ministry to us. And you are, a, you are a, an apostle, a senior pastor, a mother, and I know you have been um, very much aware of what happened in Florida concerning Trayvon Martin. As a pastor, what has been the message that you share with your congregation regarding that tragedy? Regarding the tragedy of Trayvon Martin, I feel in my heart and I believe so strongly and so deeply that the times are actually changing as such again. And as a mother, that disturbs my spirit deeply. As a pastor, it disturbs my heart deeply because I look around and I see all of the young people that I love so much and I cover and I want them to be aware and to understand that things are happening and they must be careful. So in Hinesville, Georgia, you were in Georgia and we were in Florida, this tragedy has affected, it has affected the entire nation yes. and sitting next to you is your son your son is a is a nurse anesthetist he's a business owner he's a he's a an elder in this ministry and your son when your son was growing up did you ever have to talk to him about racial profiling what did what did you have did you have to have that talk with your son as a young african-american mom with a with a young son well, you know what? I don't. I don't think I just had to just sit it down and say, "Look, black, white, black, white, or whatever." But the way that he grew up, the way that I taught him, and the the things that I said to him, the responsibilities that he had, and the understanding that he had how to be a certain type of person. 
these things that I taught him what to do and how to do. Now, I'm not saying that parents don't teach their children, but I'm saying that there are times you can teach your children and they will go astray later on. But yes, I had to help him to understand the difference between right and wrong and how things do happen to us and being careful is the greater point. So, so Elder Brian, growing up in the church, being a preacher's kid, and now you have children. Have you ever been racially profiled? Have you ever been stopped because of the color of your skin? <laughs> oh yeah, I've been uh, profiled by police, stopped by police, uh, um, so so often that you know it just it becomes a norm um, where you know as a black person that. You know, if you are stopped by police, you got to be very careful with what you say. You you might be in the right, but you just have to keep your mouth sh shut and yes sir, no sir, and just deal with the situation later. Because in this society, uh, you you could be shot, you could be beat up, and most people would say they would look at you and say, well, if the police did it. It must have been okay. <laughs> you know, it must have been okay. So. You have a son and two daughters, correct? Have you had to have a conversation? Your son is here. I think your son is here. Yes. yes. Dion. Okay, Dion, raise your hand. Have you had to have a conversation with, with your young son regarding um, Trayvon Martin? We as African American males, we as uh, black people um, were automatically seen as the suspicious one when something happens. And, um, you know, we hate to say that, yeah, this is, you know, we're post-racial, we have a black president and all of that. Yeah, that's, you know, we've made great steps in America, but we still have a ways to go in order to make things equal. And uh, when, when I look at the Trayvon Martin trial, I honestly believe that there's two sides Mm -hmm. And when people look at it, they either see themselves as the victim, they either see themselves as possibly being the one that could be shot, or their child being the one that could be shot, or they see themselves as being the shooter. Yes. yes. And if you, if you see yourself as being the shooter, well then you're happy with the way the verdict is because that gives you, that, that emboldens you that, okay, well if I shoot somebody, I got a chance of getting off. But we typically, we see ourselves as our child laying on the ground or possibly us laying on the ground and no one care. And um, so that's, I think that's why you see so many people upset over the verdict. And it just depends upon what did you see in that jury? Mm -hmm. What did they see? Did they see their child laying on the ground? Because if you saw your child laying on the ground, there's no way you could say that that man was innocent. Mm -hmm. But if you saw yourself as possibly one day holding the gun on a black person and shooting them, well then yeah, you, you want to make sure those laws are there to protect you, keep you from going to jail. Right. And when I was, when I was raising my two sons, I had two sons, and we lived on the beach. We lived on the beach, on the ocean front. We had an ocean front home. But every time my sons would, they would um, come over the bridge. Uh, whenever they would come on the bridge, they were always being stopped by police officers. I know one night my son was stopped because whenever, you know, we knew that policemen were at the foot of the bridge, at the base of the bridge, so we always told them, don't come on that bridge flying. We, would, we used to say, go, go under the speed limit because as African Americans, Black Americans, whatever the speed limit was, whatever the law was, we would always be under that. The speed limit was 45. We tell our sons, "You drive 40," you know. And so they were always being stopped. And I remember one time in particular, my my older son was coming over the bridge, and he was stopped because he was going 35 in a 45 mile zone. And the officer said he was going too slow, so he was suspicious because he was going slow. Because we told him, "You go slow when you come over that bridge." We knew that there's a police officer stationed there. Stay tuned for more Mega Press News 37 after the commercial break. Hi, I'm Shatana.
Donna McGriff, and you're watching Mega Press News 37, news you can count on from around the globe. So, with your son, your son is here. Elder Tony, son, raise your hand. You can stand up. Tell us your name. And how old are you? My name is Dion, and I'm 19 years old. So, Dion, being, being a young African American male, have you been racially profiled? Uh, yes, ma'am. How? Give an example. Um, one time. Put the mic up to you. One time, me and my cousins, we was walking to the store. And the here, 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 the area. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And the police had stopped us and harassed us. What, when you said they harassed you, what did they do or say? They, they really, they was um, they went through our car because we um, we was at we was in the neighborhood. Police be around a lot though. Mm -hmm. But we they went they went down um, they went to the car and um they was checking in the car and everything trying to see if we had drugs or anything. They was just asking us questions, what we're doing out here and all this stuff, just harassing us. Basically. We have other parents here and we also want to talk to some of these beautiful young women. You have beautiful daughters. Thank you so much, Dion. Um this is a parent, you're a parent. How many children do you have? You have a son? Yes, I have four, four children. Okay, what's the ages sons. of your children? Um, three of my children are 12, and one is 20. Okay, have you been racially profiled before? Give us your name. Have you been racially profiled before? Uh, yes, my name is Frederick Bain. Uh, yes, I've been racially profiled before. So what, what is the message you're gonna share, share with your children now concerning uh, the Trayvon Martin issue? Um, the thing that I, uh, I, I, want, I want them to understand is that life's not fair, you know, things aren't fair. Um, people, uh, they think very different than what we do. I mean, different races, we think differently um, because of our environment, because of um, society. Um, their points of view are, are very different from ours. Um, their understanding of, uh, of life it's just a little bit different than ours. We've always, um, you know, uh, we've ever often heard it said that we always think that we're the victims. Mm -hmm. um, we don't want to. We don't want. Um, I don't want my kids to always feel like they're the victims, but we are put in places where we are, where we are victims, and um, it's a shame to, to say that. Um, I, I don't. I don't really understand, you know, or, or want to tell them that there are people that are always think that they are. They are of a higher power. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I, I like to be very comfortable because I don't want them to, you know, um, just pick out, you know, different races and try to pick out, you know, mm -hmm. different things because there are very good people in every race. Right, right. Now we have we have a few minutes left. How many of you, how many of you heard President Obama speak? Um, you heard President Obama, did any of you young people hear per President Obama's address? regarding the trip on Martin on Friday when he spoke. You did, baby? Did you hear the president? You did? We're gonna listen, we're gonna go to a clip of that right now and listen to hear this is what President Obama said. He said that he Trayvon Martin could have been his son or Trayvon Martin could have been him 35 years ago. We're gonna go to that clip right now. When uh, Trayvon Martin was first shot, uh, I said that this could have been my son. Uh, another way of saying that is uh, Trayvon Martin could have been me uh, 35 years ago. There are very few African-American men in this country who haven't had the experience of being followed when they were shopping in a department store. That includes me. There are very, very few African-American men who haven't had the experience of walking across the street and hearing uh, the locks click on the doors of cars. That happens to me, at least before I was a senator. There are very few African Americans who haven't had the experience of getting on an elevator and a woman clutching her purse uh, nervously uh, and holding her breath until she had a chance to get off. That happens often. And you know, I, I don't want to exaggerate this, but those sets of experiences inform how the African-American community interprets uh, what happened 
uh, one night in Florida. Okay, that was the president speaking. Now that you heard that, you want to share your thoughts regarding what President Obama said? You can stand up. Tell us your name. You can just stand up. Oh, my name is Michelle, and I'm 19. Um, when Obama was speaking, well, the part I paid the most attention to, he was talking about how um, basically society is just the way it is, and um, the decision was made, so better decisions have to be made from here on out to better situations like these, because this is not the only time it's going to happen. It's going to happen because this is the world we live in. Not in like a similar way to Trayvon, but in the classroom. Okay. Yes, I have. How many of you young, young, um, young girls, young teenagers have been profiled? Have you ever been profiled? Just in everyday, you know, like interactions with. Sorry. <laughs> Just with, in everyday interactions with friends, coworkers, it's almost like as soon as they, you know, talk to you, they expect you to act in sort some certain way, you know, they expect you to be ghetto or you know, not be as smart as them, and they'll try you, and you know, it's just. Um, I remember when I first started at my current job, and um, a girl came and talked to me, and she automatically started like, you know bobbing her head and twisting her neck, you know, doing things that she thought that I would be receptive of or do, and all oh, my friends know I'm not really like that. So it was a little weird, I mean, you know, just automatically stereotyping me to be some sort of way, and just not like that. The Deltas are deeply and rightly concerned about this case. The Justice Department shares your concern. I share your concern. And as we first acknowledged last spring, we have opened an investigation into this matter. Now, independent of the legal determination that will be made, I believe that this tragedy provides yet another opportunity for our nation to speak honestly about the complicated and emotionally charged issues that this case has raised. We must not, as we have too often in the past, let this opportunity pass. I hope that we will approach this necessarily difficult dialogue with the same dignity that those who have lost the most, Trayvon's parents, that they have demonstrated throughout the last year and especially over the past few days. They suffered a pain that no parent should have to endure, and one that I, as a father, cannot begin to conceive. Even as we embrace their example and hold them in our prayers, we must not forego this opportunity to better understand one another and to make better this nation that we cherish. So we also heard from Attorney General Eric Holder. How many of you heard his remark at the NAACP? Um, conference in Orlando. You heard his comments. Elder Brian, tell me this. When you heard him speak, what were your thoughts? Uh, um, just to, it was just an overall impression between Eric Holder and uh, President Barack Obama that these are some of the most powerful men in the world. And not just powerful men, but powerful. Powerful black men. Black men. Yeah, yes. and, and you know they are very, very powerful. I mean, Barack Obama, uh, arguably most arguably the most powerful man in the world, and within the most powerful country in the world, you have Eric Holder, who is the chief law enforcer, mm -hmm. and he spoke about how you know you could hear it in their voices how they were actually hurt. Yes, yes. By the things that took place you know, by the humiliation that they had to endure. Mm -hmm. And here are these guys, you know, they're, they're some of the most smartest men, you know, not just black men, but some of the most smartest and most powerful men in the world. And they still had to deal with those issues. 
But one thing that I can say is that we're still able to overcome. Yes, yes, yes. D yes. Despite that, we yes. still are able to overcome and we're able to accomplish great things if we, if we look beyond, you know, if we look beyond some of that stuff. So you find racism in the workplace? Yeah, yeah. Not just on the street? Yeah. Right, well, have it in the classroom? Yeah. Where else? On the job? On the job. Well, you said the workplace. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is a young couple who's, you have two sons. Yes. Right, okay. Five and three. So when you, when you saw the trailer on Mark and when you heard the verdict rendered, yes. what were some of your concerns regarding your son's future growing up in a society as an African-American young man, well, um, as a father? The first thing I thought about was um, growing up, um, how it's so easy to be racially profiled mm -hmm. or put into a, uh, a certain category. Um, I thought about my uh, five-year-old. He wears dreads. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, just because of the way you look, people make an impression of you. But your hairstyle. Yes, it can be from your hairstyle, what you wear, how you dress, mm -hmm. uh, the way you talk, just any of that can play a factor in how people see you. But it's not necessarily so. They're only looking at the outside. They don't know the person within. But sometimes I feel like they don't, they're not there to look for the person within. But if you show them what they're looking for, that can be a problem. But it's up to us to, you know, show them that we're better than that. Mm -hmm. And then as a mother, raising two young, two young African American males, what are some of your concerns as we move forward? Wow, um, I'm, I'm concerned because. Um, my, my sons, their personalities are different, but overall, they're really nice children. Mm -hmm. um, they love people, and I don't want them to get to a place where they have to, uh, they're, they're frightened, frightened of where they're going, and maybe they can't go here, and they can't go there, or um, people not accepting them. I don't want them to live in a state of fear. Mm -hmm. In here on earth, so that's what my concern is. So, do you have any special lessons as you move forward that you some special words or plans to teach them? Yes, um, I, I thought about the case, um, I didn't watch a lot of it as Dion said, I knew the verdict as well, and I felt like why did not you know the verdict before the, the case had been um, prosecuted? Um, I, I believe some of it was God, and mm -hmm. also as well, um, it was too much. It seemed like it was too much going on. It was too much there to show you the proof, and it was taking too long to say, "Okay, he did do this. He was in the wrong." So I felt like, "Okay, they're gonna let him off for that." Mm -hmm. But I, I do, do you feel, feel that the prosecution did their job in prosecuting the case, making speaking for Trayvon Martin? Mm -hmm. Do you feel like they really spoke for him? I do believe everyone did what they could do. I, I think it had to go this way. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't want it to go this way, but it has to go this way. I believe it is an open door for other things to come. Right, right. I really do. So it had to go this way. But I, my, the thing that I did take away from the, the trial was, as African Americans, as black people, we need to wake up and realize that we have to come together. We have to unite as one. Stop taking time when he said this, she said this. Oh, you're too light-skinned, you're too dark-skinned, you're this, you're that. But we have a bigger problem that you know we're facing now. Sabrina Fulton and Tracy Martin would like to thank all of the supporters throughout the nation and the world to everybody that attended a rally, to the millions of people that signed petitions, to the prosecution, Ms. Angela Corey, Mr. Bernie Delarande, Attorney John Guy, and Mr. Rich Manti, and everybody from the prosecutor's office, to everybody that put their hoodies up, and to everybody who said, I am Trayvon, 
His family expressed their heartfelt gratitude for helping them these past 17 months. Mothers, there are other mothers who've lost their children to gang violence. Just in our city, in our area, in Fort Pierce, we have a, we, we are dealing with black on black crime. But there are other mothers, and so to, to, to Trayvon's mother, I, 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 I like what she said. She's not going to let this child define her son, but she's going to she's going to define his life. So you have closing remarks, and then leave us in a as uh, as a uh, Black Americans, I want to say to everyone that there is no open and shut case. Mm -hmm. When we think it's an open and shut case, once the jury get through with it, and once the lawyers get through with it, it ends up being something totally different. And so I think that was one of the problems that many people said this was an open and shut case. Mm -hmm. And that we know what the verdict is going to be but the verdict was not what many of us thought that the verdict was going to be. And I, and I, you know, I just want to say that to all of the mothers all over the world, every mother, I, I, I say I believe and I trust God and I, and, and I honor him because I know that we have to go to God in everything. Mm -hmm. And that in this situation, we saw the verdict, we did not like it, but it happened. We didn't like it, but we still have to trust God and honor him and believe that he will take care of everything. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you at this point. I bless you. I thank you and I honor you for what's going on right now because I understand that this is something that you allow to be so. And behind it is so much. And Father, as we look to you for everything, I want you to know, Lord God, that we believe in you. And we are leaning and depending on you right now. And God, to Trayvon Martin's mother and father, Lord, I ask you to strengthen them, to bless them on every hand. Lord, lift them up on every hand in the name of Jesus. Lord, do not allow them to fall in this particular situation. I know that they're in pain and I know that they love and I know that they miss their loved one. But Father, God, I ask you to smear their heart with the anointing of love to let them have a peace of mind and let them have trust again. And I know that it's gonna be hard to do, but Father, with you all things are possible if we just believe. And I believe you for the coverage, I believe you for the strength, and I believe you for the power to move on. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much, Dr. Wilhelmina Brown and Dr. Tony Bryan and to my wonderful panel of young people, and thank you so much for being a part of this panel. We want to say this is Elizabeth Jackson reporting, Mega Press News 37. Thank you for joining our Mega Press News 37 global coverage. Mega Press News is a daily news station. You may also find us on TV channel 14 and online at meganewspress37.ning.com. That's meganewspress37.ning.com. You may also visit us on Facebook at megapressnews37, or you can email us at megapressnews37 at yahoo.com. That's megapressnews37 at yahoo.com. Attention, publisher and owner, Gwen Spinks.